Now, government has pledged to restore all flood affected communities after a thorough assessment of damage done to homes and businesses. Several houses and businesses have been destroyed by flood nine in nine districts across the Volta, Eastern, Greater Accra, Savannah, and Bono regions, with over 38,000 persons displaced. Addressing the media on the government's efforts in providing relief for the affected residents, Deputy Minister for Information Fatima Tuababakar said government is currently doing an assessment to restore the damages after flood re recedes. To rehabilitate the affected communities. All the ministries with their district offices in the affected communities are doing assessments. You know the water levels have not completely dropped. And all the assessments and the required support should be based on the data and signs on the ground. Because today, until the water levels go very down and you are able to assess the extent of damage to property and quantify what people have lost, you may just speculate and then put out some figures. And later on, when you come back to inform the people that we may require double or triple of what we had mentioned we would need to rehabilitate the communities, they will say, oh, we don't believe you. They haven't used the resources as well and some monies have passed some way. So we are faithful, we are keeping faith with the data that will be provided after the water levels are completely down and the proper assessments are made. Meanwhile, the Water River Authority has also assured it is prepared to top up an initial 20 million cities allocated to manage the flood disaster. Eduardo Bain Kenzo is a deputy chief executive in charge of engineering and operations at the VRA. Given water, we've made sure there's enough water being supplied to these communities. Uh, as we speak today, Aveime water pump station, which was submerging water, at least we provided new water, new pumping station to pump water to ensure water is restored to the, com the community of Aveime. Uh, if you go to Mepe, at uh, the Kins K uh, Kizito, um, St. Kizito School, uh, also um, uh, set up a, a new uh, purifying system. That is a borehole system with a purifying um, uh, a filtration system to give, uh, to give the community uh, filtered water to drink. Um, as at uh, Sunday, Working with ECG, we've restored electricity uh, to the King, uh, St. Kizito uh, School and other three uh, affected, three safe events in the, in the MEP community. Um, today, because uh, uh, transportation across the MEP area is a bit difficult, we've constructed a new uh, road from MEP to Bato to allow access into MEP. Uh, that road is about five kilometers. That one is also uh, done. Our hospital department, in conjunction with the Ghana Health Services in the various districts, we supplied almost 1.5 million Ghana cities worth of drugs to the communities. Um, we have our environmental uh, department who are also in the communities working with the, with the people affected. Um, as said, uh, we'll continue to make sure we bring this relief to the, the doorsteps of all those affected, those in the safe havens and those staying with the friends and relatives. Um, we've, last Tuesday, we also went through the community to find out what additional things that they really need, which we're also compelling to send more of uh, mosquito nets and what have you. Those ones also started going as I speak today. Uh, some of our directors who are working on the ground are making sure these items go to the various communities. We'll continue to do this and make sure that the relief that the communities need, they get it. And make sure also they return back to their normal life, restore the livelihood that they've, they've suffered as of today, and um, work with government and ensure that whatever restoration has, needs to be done will be done accordingly. 20 million is money given initially. As the situation unfolds, uh, VI will still maybe add up to the money to make sure the relief that we've promised to give these communities, they get those released. 
Now, to gauge the severe impact of recent flooding on the education of children in flood-affected areas, the Honorable Education Minister, Dr. Yao Seyaduchum, has embarked on a tour of flood-affected areas early uh, today. The minister witnessed how the floods have damaged educational infrastructure and promised the government would do everything possible to solve the issues regarding education and bring some normalcy to teaching and learning. We come here fully understanding that education is at stake. And when education is at stake, calls upon all of us to come together, work together, solve the problem so that we don't leave our children behind. So that is why I'm so happy to be here with you even in the midst of challenges, uh, to see you smile, even in the midst of tragedy, uh, together to look at what we can do to really bring some semblance of normality to your life. Can't imagine the challenges that we are going through. Can't find uh, quality water to drink. Uh, the relief um, items include water and other things that we need to find a way to target you as teachers and to support you in the midst of this crisis. What I want to assure you of is that we're going to work with the regional minister, uh, the MP, district chief executive, everybody here are targeting you and your specific needs uh, so that we can support you in the midst of this great challenge. We are here because of you and we fed you. From here, we're going to have a meeting where we look at all the issues, immediate issues, medium-term issues, long-term issues, and how we can confront all of them. But I want to thank you for your service to Ghana. I want to thank you, all those who have to even go by boat to your assignment duty post every day. I want to thank you for your service. So it's not too much to ask when the NAP chair says we need life jackets. That is not too much to ask. And I'll make sure that we will all um, respond to that request in a very timeless fashion so that at least you know that out of this tragedy something will happen. But very, very concerned about your current situation. And I just want to know, you to know that you're going to be in our mind and in our hearts to look at how best we can support you. Some of the teachers have also been speaking about their challenges. The teaching and learning materials, as I talk, you are using marker. By this marker, we try to get them for ourselves. And uh, the books, too, we don't have books. The textbook that I'm using now is a textbook that is to be sold, but because we don't have any other, I have to be managing that one for the main time. So, just some of the challenges that we're facing. Exercise books, pencils, erasers, all those things to teach them. Every teacher in this area needs a life jacket. It should be a compulsory item for every teacher. We have satellite schools. Many teachers live on the mainland here and they cross the river on daily basis to their schools because they cannot get accommodation there. The accommodation question has been raised by my colleague. Yes, many teachers, if they cannot be given accommodation, they cannot resume school. After losing their homes and farms to floods, residents of Vutu Deke in the Bono East region have resolved to be rebuild their lives. Residents have started to put in place measures to ensure that they get back their community. Uh, they have been uh, sharing their experiences and how they are going about this with the press. Now, Vutu, Vutu Deke is one of the communities along the Vuto Lake badly affected by the flooding due to excessive rainfall. Daniel Ajima reports uh, the community will need the government support to start their lives all over again. All families in Vutudeke have evacuated the community into higher grounds, which are mainly farms and bushes. Wooden huts roofed with thatch through communal labor have been built by many families to serve as home for various family units. With nylons, these shelters are completely covered to prevent water from sipping through them. Many here continue to count their loss. 
I trade in fish. My husband is also a fisherman. For months, we haven't been able to go to the lake. We beg before we eat. It costs 50 cities to commute to markets and back. It is too expensive. Government should intervene. The original Vutudeke community sits on the banks of the Volta Lake with the majority of inhabitants working in the fishing value chain. Presently, the concrete homes are buried by the flood water. Without a boat, it's almost impossible to visit the community which now floats on water. The community first experienced such a flood disaster in 2010 when residents relocated to the bush. Leadership of the community say, though they have lost thousands of cities to the flood, they are looking at starting over. When the floods came in 2010, we came to live here. When it receded, we never envisaged it will flood like this ever again. So we went back to acquire our properties there. Now, we have decided to make this our town. And make it Vutudeke number two. When the floods recede, our people can go and make temporary structures and work there. But the homes will be built here. We are still setting up. Some have been able to acquire shelters, others are yet to. Though they have chosen the bushes to be the new Vutudeke, they will need government's support to live comfortably. At this location, there is no school. The old one is buried in the flood. Since we have decided to live here, we will need a shelter for school for the meantime. Meanwhile, residents are seeking support from the public to get them back on their feet. Nanaya Ojima, Joy News. East District. Well, the Ghana Health Service is investigating the unfortunate passing of Nana Obeng, a 19 year old second year law student at the University of Ghana at the Wim Polyclinic in Cape Coast. Nana Obeng's mother, Nelly Mills, said she brought her asthmatic son to the hospital to administer a nebulizer treatment to prevent an imminent asthma attack. However, she alleged that the medical staff administered an injection instead, which tragically led to her son's death shortly after. The Central Health Directorate says Nelly will have to wait for her answers after a thorough investigation and autopsy scheduled to last for the next two weeks. I don't think... I don't think anybody feels the pain I'm going through. If not, then her husband will not be sitting down. Nelly Mills is grieving. Not, She's not unable not to pick herself up after witnessing her son's untimely death at the Irene Polyclinic in Cape Coast. She tells me that her heart is in flames and nothing will douse it until she gets satisfactory answers from health authorities. I love the food. I went back to my shop with Isaac, thinking that he was eating, only for him to call me around 6.43 to say that I should come. When I opened the door and I got to say, hey, are you not worrying me? He said, oh, ma, it's as if my asthma wants to. And I said, oh, but there's no news. Because if your symptoms want to come, you've been using Ventolin all this while, and you have your Ventolin pump around here so just use it and he said he has read about the asthma that if he used to use nebulizer that would have been faster than the eventually a 19 year old son and now being a second year law student at the university of ghana perished at the Ewim polyclinic while seeking to use a nebulizer to control his asthma when we got there i saw two people there one male, one female. I greeted them and I said, my boy was an asthmatic. 
and he needed the help of the oxygen. Then the male guy shouted. I didn't know even Nana has already seated on the first chair there. Then the male guy shouted. But if he needed oxygen, was that the place for him? What about to get up and go and sit at? The third chair. And I said, ah, boss, this is the way you treat people here. We've never been here before. So if why he has sat, why he is certain it's not the rightful place, I think you need to say it in a nice manner for him to move. You, you cannot more treat my boy here. Nelly said although she wanted to stay with her son, she rather chose to rush the pharmacy to buy a prescribed medicine. But upon her return, Nana Obin's condition had deteriorated. When we got there, only for me to know that the medicine was seven cities. I thought I said, ah, seven cities. And they don't have it at the facility there. You let's go. So we were chatting with the driver. When we got there, I met my boy vomiting. He's vomited. And they gave me rubber or something that he should vomit inside. Something, something. And I said, ah, what is happening? Then he got up, he became like a tent. So when I was shouting, they came to hold me that I should go out. Then my boy shouted that they've injected him. So I was asking, what injection? What is injection? Nana is not here for injection. Who gave him the injection? Nelly sits on the favorite sofa her son used to occupy in the living room. Her eyes are fixed on his dance videos on TikTok. She begs authorities to set her heart at ease by telling her why her son died. I went inside only to go and meet, again to meet my life, my boy lying there, lifeless, so I started shouting. Hey, my boy is dead though, my boy is dead though, because this thing, the, the underfoot were orange. Then they said he wasn't dead. I said, ah, this person lying down. So they took me outside. Later I was there when Isaac came to ask me that. One lady is saying they should come and ask me the boy's name, the date of birth, blah, blah, blah. And I said, ah, but you don't know anything about my boy. And you've injected him. Who paid for the injection? Who? Well, we're not there with any health insurance. I never went there with any health insurance. Who, who even instructed that medicine? Because we're not there for injection. Only for them to declare him dead. I asked the cause of the death of my boy. Because I wanted, I needed to know. And they said they don't deal with that. But they gather all cause of death and discuss it at the end of the month. So we should go and put our complaints on the paper. Authorities at the Green Polyclinic to join news that the Central Regional Health Directorate had ordered them not to speak to the media. Meanwhile, the Central Regional Health Director, Dr. Marion Oko Uusu, says a committee has been formed to investigate the cause of Nana Obin's death. An autopsy has also been done and results will be ready in two weeks. But until then, Nelly Mills will continue to stay in her son's favorite seat, hoping the outcome of the investigations will heal her aching heart. Jojo Kovner, Joy News. Such a tragic development there. Now, former Supreme Court Judge Justice William Atuguba has described the Supreme Court's decision about James Judge Equation's dual citizenship matter as scandalous and alien to the judicial system in Ghana and anywhere in the world. He argued that the court shot itself in the foot in a judgment it passed on the matter. Justice Atugba was speaking at a public lecture organized by Solidaire in Accra on Tuesday. The Supreme Court in May 2023 ruled that James Jackie Quayson cannot hold himself as the member of parliament for Asin North in the central region. The court declared his election unconstitutional because of his dual citizenship status. Speaking at a public lecture on Tuesday, the former Supreme Court judge went hard on his former colleagues. In a blunt assessment of the judgment of the Supreme Court, Justice William Atuguba described the decision as alien and scandalous. The James Chachi Quilson's decision by the Supreme Court is with all due respect scandalous in that the court 
in the teeth of the subtle maxim res judicata et non quieta movere re adjudicated the same matter that has been adjudicated upon by the High Court on the merits. Never seen this type of thing in any judicial system. All that was left was its execution according to court processes. Again, the stress laid by the court on the statutory processes for acquisition and renunciation of citizenship shot itself in the foot. If the certificate of renunciation is so mandatory and conclusive, why was it not conclusive in its effect to qualify Jachi Kwesin when he received the data 26 November 2020, whereas the parliamentary election was held on 7 December 2020? He called on judges to eschew corruption by upholding their personal values and not allowing ethnic and other interests to influence judicial determinations. Personal independence relates to the commitment of individual judges to the judicial values that ensure their impartiality and fairness. I'm here referring to values such as eschewing corruption and not allowing ethnic and other particularistic considerations to affect judicial determinations. He also urged them to uphold judicial independence by making judges accountable to the people and the state. Other stories now, and the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, is warning many Ghanaian businesses will collapse if government does not remove some taxes when the 2024 budget is presented. The Finance Ministry is engaging stakeholders ahead of the 2024 budget presentation to Parliament in November. According to President of Guta, Dr. Joseph Obing, so many businesses are on the verge of collapse and without an intervention from government, which includes the removal of taxes, many of such businesses will go under. Ten businesses are, again, saddled with numerous taxes. As we all know, the introduction of the three um, um, new taxes because um, of the IMF programs and uh, that we call obnoxious taxes. The multiplicity nature of these taxes uh, have made businesses reeling mm -hmm. under those effects. Um, we have to also contend with high interest rates and are being consumed by high rate of inflation. Uh, because uh, when there's uh, so much inflation, it does not help businesses because what it does is to um, curtail the purchasing power of the consuming public and thereby affect our um, um, turnover, business turnover. So um, this have actually uh, reduced the growth of businesses. Where, again, we are also uncompetitive in the sub-region by um, these same um, taxes and other costs of doing business that are very high um, in, in this country. So we, uh, if you talk about um, utility bills, it has also gone up, um, as we know, over 50 or so percent. So if you, you, you add up all these problems, it means that um, Ghanaian businesses are on the verge of um, folding up and uh, being collapsed. Oh, Dr. Joseph Obeng says Guta will be looking forward to government cancelling the COVID-19 levy and the special import levy in the 2024 budget. Look um, on so many angles how we can reduce um, these taxes for us to be competitive and for us to be productive as well and for government itself to be able to get the revenue because when um, the um, uh, when the cost of doing business is low, it means that it will enhance on productivity where government can even have more of the revenue that it seeks. Mm -hmm. And so um, we are talking about the 1% um, COVID um, levy uh, to be removed. We also talk about the special import um, a levy of 2% um, that has been um, imposed on us um, since the previous administration and all that. And that we also are talking about the VAT, uh, the complex nature of VAT, the unfair um, um, or the disparities that the VAT bring to bear in the business community, the high rate of the VAT itself. 
and the complex nature, as we have always been seeing, is not helping um, businesses, the growth of businesses, especially that of um, manufacturers. And that we, we propose that um, we go back to the flat rate um, where government um, uh, receive 18% unrefundable um, 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 VAT of 18% at the port, and then we come and pay 5% flat rate um, at the market. This is still your news prime. We'll take a break. We'll return with more stories. Stay with us. Welcome back from the break. And let's now turn our attention to Ghana's cocoa sector, a major foreign earner for the country. And according to Asoko Insight, the cocoa industry employs approximately 850,000 farm families directly. But today, there are several issues confronting the sector. These challenges have led to calls by farmers for the dissolution of the Ghana Cocoa Board. According to the president of the Concerned Cocoa Farmers Association, Nana Boating Bonsu, the time has arrived for cocoa farmers to sell their produce directly to buyers since Cocoa Board has failed in its duties in the interest of the Ghanaian cocoa farmer. What is the finance minister coming to do? At the end of the day, uh, we gave you the whole country just to take care of it and what happened. So uh, Cocoa Board itself is a, is a, it is a, a collapse issue. Institution that has collapsed already. We know it and we foresee it. We said it several times, but they never listen. At the end of the day, as a cocoa farmer, I can sell my cocoa directly to the buyer to make my money rather than relying on the government. The government has nothing better to offer for the farmer. As I'm speaking to you, a lot of people, millions of people, want to cut down their cocoa tree, want to shift from cocoa to a different crop. All because they seen that they have been enslaved for so many years. And what is Ken Oferata coming to do? He was the finance minister, and what happened? The industry has collapsed. So they should allow with the cocoa farmers it directly sell our cocoa produce to make our money. Because other countries are doing it. They sell their cocoa on their own. Why is it that what interest is government so much interested in that he cannot even allow with the farmers to sell our produce than for him to sell it for us? then it means he's getting more. We don't need Kenoferata, and even we don't even need the wine, it was and other things. At the end of the day, they've caused a financial loss to the state, which they have to pay for. So what is the state of the Ghana Cocoa Board today? My colleague, Kofi Ajay, from our research desk, joins me in studio with some numbers. Kofi, what does the data say? Also on the screen right now, you can write an analysis of cocoa. Uh, ranging from Cote d'Ivoire to somewhere around Ecuador. And mm. we know Ghana is now second to Cote d'Ivoire. Mm. Look at 2020, 2021 crop season when, see the gap between Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. Cote d'Ivoire was able to produce close to 2.2 million, you know, metric tons. Ghana was uh, producing mm. a little about 1 million. Yeah. Now, some years down the line, if you look at 2022, 2023 season, Cote d'Ivoire is still around where it started in 2022, yeah. mm -hmm. around 2.2 million, million metric tons. Ghana has now dropped to 750,000 mm -hmm. metric tons. Now, look at the gap between Cote d'Ivoire and mm -hmm. Ghana. Mm -hmm. It's widening. Mm -hmm. And currently, there are two countries giving Ghana a tough competition. They are coming. Mm -hmm. They are putting in place you know, measures to make sure that they produce, i.e., we are talking about Ecuador and Brazil. Mm -hmm. They want to sit at the, the big table mm. and when we talk about cocoa producers they also want to be part ecuador is currently now the third producer the mm. highest producer of cocoa uh, across the globe but let's look at cocoa board aside from their dwindling mm. um, you know um production we've also been looking at cocoa board's um Finances. you know financial performance from 2012 to 20 uh, 21. Mm. so between this period if you look at it on the screen cocoa board has made a total loss of 5.1 billion Ghana cities. Mm. And in that same period, amounts that they've gained as profits is less than 500 million Ghana cities. Mm. And if you look at from the last time Cocoa Board made profits, if you are tracking from 2015, oh, that was 2015, that was mm. the last time Cocoa Board made profits. And since then, mm. their losses have been increasing from 150 million Ghana cities to now a whopping 2.4 billion cities mm. in 2021. Mm. Mm. What we are learning is that in the just ended, uh, you know, planting season, cocoa, uh, you know, we lost actually 150,000 metric tons of our cocoa production due to galamsey and people actually smuggling their cocoa from Ghana to other parts of the country. Their debts has also been rising. They've been racking up debts. 
the cocoa bills. If you look at the debt restructuring exercise mm -hmm. that was done, cocoa bills were not part of the first exchange program. But IMF looked at their books and they mm -hmm. saw that this is not sustainable. They have to be part of the second exchange program. So you look at that debt and cocoa loans is now around somewhere around 19, million, 19 billion you know, Ghana cities. And so that is the picture that the, the data actually paints about Cocoa Board. All right. Thank you very much. So that's my colleague, Kofi Ajay, there. Now let's take you to the United Kingdom because uh, the story about Ghana's properties in the UK being attached to a judgment debt by Trafigura has been raging on for some days now. Now, yesterday, the High Commissioner in uh, Ghana's High Commissioner in the UK said that the only property attached to this judgment was the uh, Ghana Bank uh, building in the UK. Today, my colleague, um, has been there uh, to check on the status of this particular building for us and he's come through with this report. This is the entrance to the Ghana International Bank here in the heart of central London in the UK. It sits within a six-story property popularly known as Regina House which the government of Ghana currently owns and controls. But that ownership and control may be coming to an end soon. Regina House is part of five other properties which the government of Ghana owns and controls in the UK which have been attached for the purposes of being auctioned to defray a 140 million US dollar judgment debt owed to Trafigura. In January 2021, Trafigura obtained a judgment debt to the tune of over 160 million US dollars against the government of Ghana. This was in connection with the government's illegal termination of the contract for the installation and operation of two power plants in the country. After over two and a half years, negotiations and renegotiations and a plain attempt by the government of Ghana to block the execution of that judgment debt award, it perhaps is time Trafigura is moving to auction. At least two of the properties on the list of five, which include the Ghana High Commission and the Chancery, are protected by diplomatic immunity. But Regina House isn't and may well be on its way to a new owner, Trafigura. From Central London, my name is Manuel Cranting, reporting for Joy News. So that's Manuel Cranting there with that report. Now, Liberia's presidential election is heading for a runoff. The country election management body moments ago announced that none of the 20 aspirants contesting the polls secured the required 50% plus one threshold required, which is required under Article 83, Clause 3 of the country's constitution. Liberia's incumbent, President George Weah, who is seeking re-election on a ticket of the Coalition for Democratic Change, secured the highest vote of 804,087, representing 43.83% of the valid vote cast, but will have to run a second contest with his main contending, Joseph Boakai, of the Unity Party, who got 796,961, representing 43.44%. The outcome of the 10th October contest will now have to be decided with a second contest on November 4, uh, at November 4, November 1, rather. 43.83%. What would Jeremiah Z vote? Votes obtained 9,149, constituting 0.50%. Yofi Luther M, Rebuilders, votes obtained. 6,479, constituting 0.35%. Total valid votes, 1,834,516, constituting 100%. Total invalid votes, 114,639. Total votes, 1,949,000. 155. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, the results of the 10th October 2023 polls show that the ticket of the Congress for Democratic Change, CDC, obtained the highest number of votes, 804,087, constituting 43.83%. 
followed by a ticket of unity party, which obtained 796,961 votes, constituting 43.44%. However, ladies and gentlemen of the press, Article 83B of the Constitution of Liberia requires that for any presidential ticket to win outright on the first ballot, that ticket must acquire at least 50% plus one of the valid votes cast. Article 83B further states that where no presidential ticket obtains at least 50% plus one, the two presidential tickets that receive well, the by-election is to come off on November 14 this year. Uh, the runoff uh, would come off on November 14 this year. Now, to some other stories. Ghana Traditional Council insists shops must remain closed for at least 24 hours ahead of the final funeral rite of the late Queen Mother of the Ghana State, Nadede Omedru III. The council initially said shops must be closed from 26th October through 21st October. However, that has been revised. Additionally, there is a partial ban on noise making in the region. That's just two of a number of restrictions that have been imposed in the region. On Wednesday, 25th October, market women in a procession will present foodstuffs and other items to the traditional council from 1 p.m. There will be cultural display, music and dance, and storytelling. On Thursday, 26 October 2023, the cultural display, music and dance, and storytelling with Asafu Achame and Asafu Anyame parading will continue. On Friday, the 27th of October 2023, we shall keep a vigil. This will start in the morning with Asafu companies displaying amidst the firing of musketry. Then from 6 p.m., the clergy will be here for a short service for the repose of the soul of Gamanye. There will also be viewing. The Asafu Acheme and Asafu Anyame will continue cultural display, music and dance and storytelling throughout the night. On Saturday, the 28th October 2023, which is the burial day, there will be an interdenominational burial service, which will start from 9 a.m. to 11. After the service, there will be a traditional the traditional burial rites, which will involve the Asafu Acheme, Asafu Anyame companies, parading the coffin through the principal streets of Accra under the direction of the Municipal Security Council and the MMTD. As we are all aware, burial of such royals are private matters. So that will come on at the end of the day. This is still the Joy News Prime. We'll take a break. We'll bring you showbiz. All right, so welcome back. Let's do showbiz now. And Charlie. <laughs> How far? I'm good. I'm good, Kojo. Uh, it's okay. Let's just go straight. No, no, no. <laughs> a, a friend of mine called Rashid yeah. Abrobra. Yeah. Uh, he's the business development manager for Hantamaro Bank. Okay. Solid guy. Right. He likes you so much. Oh, I like him too. Today is his birthday. Happy birthday, Rashid. So I want to, we want to wish Happy Rashid. Happy birthday. Yeah. Right. Happy God's birthday, pleasure. Rashid. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's talk about Ochiame Kwame. Okay. Uh, he was a guest on uh, The Bro Code. It's okay. the podcast by Kaliji and Friends. Okay. And, uh, oh, I want to be, be on it one day. You want to be on code. it? We yeah, I'll tell him. I'll tell yeah, him so you let's join. Do code, yeah. So uh, he spoke about a number of things, and one okay. of them was, according to him, mm -hmm. a lie society has told us to program us you know, towards a certain narrative. Okay. And it's the fact that he believes mm -hmm. um, if your partner should sleep with another person, that doesn't make your partner a cheat. Stupid as it, it sounds, our society has created a certain idea that if your partner goes to sleep with another person that is not you, your partner has cheated. How am I cheating on you? I'm not using your body. <laughs> wow. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Even, even when you are married. No, no, you have not cheated. 
That's yes, my body. Cheated. It is my body. If yeah. my wife decides that she wants to go and copulate with another person, how does that affect me? No, but um, when when you are getting ready, they say the two shall become one. Exactly. So, it's, so, so we are one. That is what yes. if you <laughs> when you marry, you realize that you and your wife are not one. You are two. <laughs> she, because until you get to separate yourself from your partner, you are going to always create problems of attachment. So this is, these are some of the lies that the society tells us, that you and your partner have become one. So if she goes to argue with someone, we'll go if she goes to post a photo of herself showing her nyash, you are disgracing the family. It's not true. Her actions are her actions. Yours are yours. But isn't that Western, but, though? Isn't that a Western ideology? Was it something that was in our traditional setting before? In our traditional setting, the man could marry more than two, two. could yeah. marry three. I guess. But before he could marry the, the extra two, he must apologize to his wife and buy her something and give her money and be on, completely honest that this is what I'm going to do. But even no matter what, how much you buy for the woman, she is still going to suffer every time you go to be with wife B or wife C because she's attached to you in that way. She has been programmed that she is yours, my wife, my car, my house, my body. It's all possession. Archbishop Duncan Williams said that there's nothing more dangerous for a man to see the love of his wife, the love of his life, walk into the arms of another person. You know. Right, so that was a charming comment. But I'll indulge all of you to probably go listen to the whole podcast. Okay. So it gives it context. So you understand him better. Uh, I mean, I don't subscribe to what he's saying, mm -hmm. but I can understand where he's coming from. Okay. But anyway, let's talk about Odak Kitty Andy of Mental One Fair. Hey, he you love him. He was my favorite oh, that, that, that year. Right. Yeah, I loved him so right. much. Right. So mm -hmm. he's been talking about some of the things that caused his career, you know, oh. to, you know, um, blow out out there. And it's because he signed a bad deal for 10 years. Mm. No, life is not straight. You signed a wrong contract? Yeah, I signed a contract for 10 years. With who? With my first label, the, the first record label that released my first album. The name is? Doris. Doris. Joris. Joris. Yeah. And what was wrong about that contract? Yeah, I think it was too, the years, the years was like too much. Um, I was supposed to take my time to read the contract which i didn't so i blame myself for mm. reading the um signing the contract without giving it to a lawyer or somebody to interpret it to me but what was in there that made it wrong apart from the yeah, time duration the, the time duration was was too high it was too big for me and then after that the produce after releasing the first album the producer traveled so we couldn't work again that but uh yeah i guess um, it 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 would you know encourage other people to mm. do due diligence okay so wish him all the best right. and on that note we say thank you for being with us today there's more news on my journal.com happiness is fine business with that <laughs>